Well, morning again, everyone, and welcome back to my study. And let me pick up where John left off yesterday. We've just uh, seen the, the the rise up through uh, the time of Joshua, with the people committing to walking God's ways, and the descent uh, over several generations, uh, a downward spiral of uh, moral decay in Israel as the period of the judges unfolds, and the people forget their promise, and they uh, treat each other shamefully. We see something of that in our passage on Sunday in Isaiah chapter 5. And the cry several times in the last five chapters of, uh, of Judges is uh, that the people did whatever they wanted because there was no godly leadership. That sounds very reminiscent of Isaiah chapter 1, doesn't it? And we're, we're crying out at that point, aren't we, for great King David. It'd be easy to jump to King David at that point. Um, but I think I want to spend a, a, a few minutes this morning on two families, uh, two places where God was already at work before the people of Israel realised they needed a king, before they cried out to God for rescue. There are two families uh, who would have been unseen, uh, by and large, by the people around them, uh, but through whom God does tremendous things. Uh, the first is is there in the family of uh, Boaz and Ruth. Ruth is the most unlikely uh, person. She is a Moabites. She's from uh, south and uh, and east of uh, uh, of Judah. She's a foreigner. She's not a person from the family of promise. The Moabites have been largely enemies of God's people. But she marries into the family of promise, and even though her husband dies. She commits to, to following the God of Israel. She's become converted. And she attaches herself to uh, her mother-in-law, um, uh, Naomi. And they uh, move back to Israel. And there she meets Boaz, a faithful man from Bethlehem. Uh, remember, we're, we're in the time of the judges here. There are not many faithful people around. Boaz would have been a very unusual man. Uh, and so you've got Ruth, the foreigner, and Boaz, the unusually godly man from Bethlehem. And God in his providence brings them together. And uh, Boaz takes care of Ruth, as he should do. And she uh, uh, is clearly a godly lady in God's service. They're an unusual couple, no doubt about it, in the time of the Judges. And through them, the book of Judges says, uh, comes King David. Uh, these are uh, David's great-grandparents, and David won't be seen for uh, perhaps 50 years at the end of the book of Ruth. And nobody's looking for that family line from the back end of nowhere to produce a king. But God is. And God in his wisdom has used this godly couple in a time of great ungodliness through their faithfulness to him and commitment to each other to raise up a king. The answer to the great cry that the people haven't made yet and won't make for decades. Then we come into the beginning of 1 Samuel. I just want to touch on the first few chapters of Samuel because we'll get to the kings tomorrow. But before we can get to the kings, we need to uh, refine the spiritual life of Israel. So even whilst over in Bethlehem, God is uh, preparing the way for King David. So in the, the family of Elkanah and his godly wife, Hannah, who is barren, who cannot have a child, uh, God answers her great cry of distress, her great prayer, uh, her faithfulness in coming to God and asking for him to remove uh, the, the, that which stops her from having a child. And she commits to giving that child back to God. And God gives her Samuel, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. He grows up before the Lord in the temple in a time of, again, a, a time of uh, delinquency. Eli's family are, are terrible leaders of God's people spiritually. They're corrupt. Uh, they're selfish. They're, they're, they're appalling people. 
and yet uh, Hannah entrusts her son not to Eli, but to God. And he grows up before the Lord, trained in the ways of the Lord, and listening to the voice of the Lord. And he replaces Eli's family as the prophet and priest of Israel, and is able to uh, speak God's word uh, clearly to this delinquent generation. So God has, in his kindness, behind the scenes, raised up a king and raised up a prophet priest uh, who would uh, bring God's people back to him in answer to the great problem of the people's sin. Of course, both uh, the king and the prophet priest are uh, roles that Jesus himself fulfills. And both are types of Jesus. Um, we'll think about that over the next few days, I think. But what I want us to see is, is the way God is at work behind the scenes. Before we even realise there's a problem, because of our sinfulness, we can't see there's a problem. But God sees it. And in his grace, he has begun to answer the prayers of the people uh, generations before they even pray the prayers. We can trust ourselves to God, whatever the state of the church, whatever the state of the nation, whatever the state of our own hearts. We can trust that the God of grace, who loves us, is working uh, to, to solve all of those problems. And he has proven that, hasn't he, by sending the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you uh, cause us to have a great trust that you know what you're doing. This time of great uncertainty we're in, in the church in our diocese, in the, the, the nation and the world, uh, things can look out of control, but you have been at work behind the scenes, uh, moving uh, the pieces around, perhaps uh, people and places that, that seem insignificant to many will become incredibly important in your hands. And so, Father, would you give us a deepening trust that you know what you're doing, that you have uh, worked already through these incredible uh, historical instances to bring us Jesus and you will bring your plan to fruition uh, in ways that perhaps we can't see. Please help us to trust you in Jesus name. Amen.